Well, I hope you can all hear me um, because I can't hear or see you, and that will remain so uh, for, the per uh, for the duration of the presentation. Welcome on behalf of the Institute of Physics, Hereford and Worcester Centre to the last of the season's webinars. The talk will last approximately one hour with time for questions at the end. Please keep your cameras and microphones off for the talk. Well, I think they already are the control separately. Please keep your cameras, uh, as I said, uh, off for the talk. You, the audience, will not appear on camera or microphone, but can communicate uh, to ask questions via the question function. There should be a function box on the go to uh, screen and you can, um, uh, you can queue questions for the end. As time allows, a selection will be put to Malcolm Longer on your behalf. Similar questions will be merged together. A recording of the webinar will be available on YouTube channel in a few days. Uh, links will be posted in the chat, hopefully. Our new lecture program will start in September. Please check eventsiop.org for details and format nearer the time. It's still being developed, and we're not quite sure what the COVID situation will be um, later in the year. We are delighted to welcome as our guest speaker this evening, uh, Professor Malcolm Long here, the em very eminent astrophysicist. Malcolm Long, there, CBE, FRS, FRSC, is Jacksonian Professor Emeritus of Natural Philosophy and Director uh, of Development at the Cavendish Laboratory, Cambridge. Um, going back to the Martin Ryle era uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, he was a fellow of Clare Hall, Cambridge, and is held a visiting professorship at the California Institute of Technology, the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, and Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He was appointed the ninth Astronomer Royal of Scotland in 1980, as well as the Regis Professor of Astronomy, at University of Edinburgh, and the Director of the Royal Observatory, Edinburgh. He was head of the Cavendish Laboratory from 1997 to 2005. He has served on and chaired many international committees, boards and panels, working with both NASA and the European Space Agency. He is, current, he is currently chair of the Scottish University Physical Alliance, International Advisory Committee, and editor-in-chief of biographical memoirs of the, of the Fellows of the Royal Society. His main research interests are in high energy astrophysics, astrophysical cosmology, and the history of physics. Um, he's also uh, involved in public outreach. He has written eight books. I don't know how he's found the time for it, but he has written eight books and many articles on his work. Recent books include Maxwell's Enduring Legacy, of which we're going to hear a little bit tonight, A Scientific History of the Cavendish Laboratory, and the Oxford Handbook of the History of Modern Cosmology and the third edition of Theoretical Concepts in Physics. His other interests include music, mountain walking, completing the Munros in 2011, a major achievement, art, architecture and golf. But he's here to talk about Maxwell, not golf or anything else. Thank you very much, Malcolm. I'll hand you over to yourself. And, uh, um, I, I look forward to enjoying what you say. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me and see me? Yes, I can hear yes. you and see you. That's very good. Well, I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be uh, present in person to, to give this lecture to you. It's always more fun doing it that way. But I'll try the best I can to keep this as lively as I can, just as if as I was waving my arms in front of you as I normally would. Uh, this is a terrific story. And I'm going to tell you the story, the real story of how Maxwell derived the equations and the rather remarkable route that he took to getting there. Now, it goes very back, very far back to real, the beginning of his, uh, of his life, as I'll show. We'll just run through some historical slides, first of all, and then we'll get to Maxwell's equations. <clears throat> now, uh, as you we all know, Maxwell was an experimental and theoretical physicist of genius, and I would emphasize that he was as brilliant at experiment as he was in theory. Here's just a very brief list of some of the major achievements. Maxwell's equations we're going to deal with tonight. 
then is the stability of Saturn's rings, which again foreshadows the current theories of the origin of planetary systems. The kinetic theory of gas and the nature of thermodynamics, the theory of color vision, stability of control systems, mathematical physics, thermodynamics, and the measurement of fundamental constants of physics. That's a pretty good uh, menu of achievements. And all of these, his contributions are absolutely fundamental. Now, what I'm going to go through tonight it was actually written uh, about oh, six years ago when we were celebrating the bicentenary of philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. And I was on a panel uh, to select the 10 or 20 great papers published there. And among these was Eddington's paper on the deflection of light by the sun. And I had to write that one up. And then just before we went to publication, I had an emergency call saying, look, the person who's got to write about Maxwell's great paper can't do it. Could you write this up in two weeks? So that's uh, where I spent a really remarkable three weeks working exclusively on this paper and getting to the guts of what it was about. And really, it was an astonishment uh, three weeks where one really got into Maxwell's mind to how he actually did this job. So for details, do look on this uh, reference here where you find many more details. The other place to look is in the new edition, which was mentioned of my book, Theoretical Concepts in Physics. And there is a much more complete analysis of what I'm going to talk about tonight, including all the mathematics, more mathematics than you would ever want. But there we are. That's for the complete story. Now, <clears throat> Maxwell was born in 1831, and here's the photograph of the family home at 14 India Street in Edinburgh, now the home of the James Clark Maxwell Foundation. The family moved to the country home near Glen Lair in Dumfries, where James spent much of his early years. Here is the family home from, a, from 1880s, and this is after Maxwell had actually built the wing that you see on the left-hand side, the rather uh, more grandiose Victorian building attached to the farmhouse. But this is where Maxwell spent his early years. Uh, this is a, a lovely set of pictures uh, drawn by Jemima Wedderburn, his older cousin, who was a brilliant artist and painted pictures of family life uh, every day at, at the request of her, her mother. Her mother said, you must paint, paint one picture every day. And that gives us a beautiful image of Maxwell's early life. Here is a painting by Jemima of James and Jemima tubbing. They're using uh, washing tubs as little boats to, on, 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 on the nearby river that goes past the house. And here at the bottom right, you can see again him being chased by his tutor, having gone off in his tub. Now, from the very beginning, Maxwell was very inquisitive about everything. Uh, he would say often, show me how it does. Now, I'm sorry, my Scottish accent is from the northeast, not from the southwest, but you've got to accept that I can't quite get it right. He would say, what's the go of that? What's the go of that? And if he didn't get a proper answer, he would say, OK, but what's the particular goal of that? So from the very earliest, Maxwell was very, very interested. He went to an Edinburgh Academy from 1841 to 47 uh, at the home of his, uh, his cousin, his aunt Isabella Whittaber. But even at that stage, he wrote his first paper, uh, on the description of oval curves, which was read to the Royal Society of Edinburgh by Professor James Forbes. Uh, you cannot have a 14 or 15 year old uh, lecturing to the Royal Society of Edinburgh. But that's an, an, an example of his precocity uh, as a scientist. There's a remark uh, that some eccentricity of behavior earned him the name Dafty. Well, that's a picture of him. And you will notice that uh, he is knitting. He's got knitting needles uh, as a young man. Now, that's nothing strange in Scotland. When I was at school uh, as a little boy, I had to learn to knit too. It's a very, very advanced civilization up there. Now, he then went to Edinburgh University for the period 1847 to 1850. And we've got a record of the lecture courses he attended, as well as the books that were borrowed, he borrowed from the library. 
So it was a pretty, pretty terrific education. Kellen, Forbes and, and Hamilton in mathematics, natural philosophy and logic. But even more impressive is the books that were borrowed from the library by Maxwell. Uh, Cauchy's Calcul Differential, Fourier's Theory de la Chaleur, Monge's Geometry Descriptive, Newton's Optics, Poisson's Mechanics, Taylor's Scientific Memoirs, and Willis's Principle of Mechanism. Now, this is pretty tough stuff that he's reading while he is an undergraduate at Edinburgh University. And I will draw your particular attention to the theory of heat and also the principles of mechanism by Willis who was just ending his stint as Jacksonian professor as Maxwell took over the Cavendish Laboratory in 1871. He carried on publishing during this time here two more papers on the theory of rolling curves and the equilibrium, uh, and the equilibrium uh, of elastic solids. Now, after that, uh, Forbes recommended he should, should go to Cambridge. And here's the letter that he wrote to Hewell, the master of Trinity College. Pray do not suppose that I am not aware of his exceeding couthness, as well mathematical as in other respects. I thought the society and drill of Cambridge the only chance of taming him and much advise his going. And this is supported uh, by the words of the obituary by Peter Guthrie Tate, where he writes, he brought to Cambridge in the autumn of 1850 a mass of knowledge which is really immense for so young a man, but in a state of disorder appalling to his methodical private tutor. Well, the good news is that Cambridge didn't tame him, but simply enhanced his abilities in all his intuitive skills. He got a fellowship at Trinity College in 1855, and here he is uh, with his famous color wheel, which sadly we can't talk about this evening. But during that time in Cambridge, he wrote two important papers, one on analogy in nature and the other on Faraday's line of force, which he read to the Cambridge Philosophical Society. Now, in 1856, he accepted the post of Nat Professor of Natural Philosophy in Aberdeen at Marshall College to be closer to his family. His father died in 1856 and he then married Catherine Mary Dew in 1859, who was the daughter of the principal of Marshall College. That did not prevent him being made redundant when Marshall College and King's College were combined in Aberdeen to form the University of Aberdeen. Now, during this period, he again produced some out absolutely outstanding works. He won the Adams Prize for the motion of Saturn's rings and also wrote on the dynamical top and the theory of colors. Well, uh, here is uh, James uh, with, uh, with, with Catherine. Uh, the painting on the left we've recently had completely restored and it's looking very, very beautiful. It will go up in the new Cavendish Laboratory, which we'll be opening in a couple of years. On the right is a more formal photograph. I love this picture uh, because uh, everybody says that people grow to look like their dogs. And the little dog, to me, bears up more than a passing resemblance to James. Interestingly, all of the dogs were always called Toby. James always had a dog and it was always called Toby. So it would walk with him around the laboratories, seeing how the students were getting on and so on. Now, uh, he was not long in taking up a new position at King's College London, where he was appointed Professor of Natural Philosophy. And this is the period of some of his greatest work, which we're going to talk about tonight. Here are the four areas of science where it's really quite astounding what he achieved. Illustrations of the dynamical theories of gases, which is the origins of, of his version of kinetic theory. On physical lines of force, which we'll look at in a moment. The work on the viscosity of gases, the experiments. And then finally, the great paper, The Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field of 1865. Now, let's then start the building up of Maxwell's equations. Already in 1856, he had published 
the paper on Faraday's lines of force, drawing attention to the use of an analogy to work out what the equations of electromagnetism should look like. Now, and again, in the history of science, Sridharis wrote, Max was one of the very few British physicists who combined the experimental and philosophical Scottish tradition with the mathematical training provided at Cambridge. And it's that combination that is the, uh, is the source of Maxwell's genius. Also, he had this way of working by analogy, which we will see absolutely uh, dominated the way he discovered the equations. In the preface to his great treatise uh, of 1873 on electricity and magnetism, Maxwell recalled, before I began the study of electricity, I resolved to read no mathematics on the subject till I first read through Maraday, Faraday's experimental researches on electricity. What he then did was to start to build up Maxwell's equations by using the analogy between incompressible fluid flow and magnetic lines of force. You can think of, in a simple way, the velocity u being analogous to the magnetic flux density b. For example, if the tubes or streamlines diverge, the strength of the field goes down, as does the fluid velocity. Now, building on the laws of current electricity, electrostatics, and magnetostatics, and Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, by this time he had written down the primitive but incomplete set of equations for electromagnetic fields, E, B, H, and J. And if we write them in modern SI notation, here is how far he got in the mathematization of electromagnetism by 1856. We've got the, the, the expression for electromagnetic induction. We've got the relationship between currents and fields. We've got the origin of electric field lines on charges. And we've got the fact that the divergence of the magnetic flux density is zero. As we will see, that Maxwell doesn't use B in his exposition, but rather mu H, as we'll see just in a moment. Now, what I find really dramatic about his use of the equations is his use of the vector potential A that had been introduced by Neumann, Weber, and Kirchhoff in order to evaluate magnetic fields due to currents. So, if we look at Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, for example, we've got B equals curl A, then we've got curl E equals D by DT of minus curl A, and E equals minus DA by DT. So, that's the way in which he was actually mathematizing the electromagnetic field. He still had no mechanical model for the behavior of the fields. Now, just one nice little footnote to this story. Um, Maxwell actually suggested the names for the differential operators that appear in the equations in a paper of 1871. He called what we call the gradient, the slope, and what we now call the divergence, the convergence by reversing the sign. The curl is, a, is more fun. Um, here is Maxwell and his family curling on St. Mary's Isle in December 23rd, 1853. And the interesting thing about curling is that when you throw the curling stone, you make it rotate in, uh, on the ice so it can bend as it moves across the ice. And what uh, David Ritchie, the late uh, chairman of the James Clark Maxwell Foundation, stated he adopted the term curl to describe two-dimensional electric and magnetic waves. He said they are not a twirl, which would imply three dimensions. So that may or may not be the origin of the term curl. The second uh, footnote is the use of the mathematics of fluids. Maxwell was well used to the mathematics of fluid flow. William Thomson, there's a lot of Kelvin, and Maxwell's models of atoms as vortices in a frictionless ether had involved studies of the stability of these structures using serious fluid mechanics, which again, they were both experts at that. And in fact, here's an example that we've got in the laboratory of Maxwell's zoetrope showing a triatomic model as 
three stable vortices within a frictionless ether. You see here, uh, I've taken off the separate images from the zoetrope, and you can see the motion of the three vortices moving through each other. And what they showed was that is a stable configuration. And in their mid 19th century view, this is a model of a triatomic molecule. Now, the next great step was in the four papers on physical lines of force from 1861 to 1862. And here they are here. And these are the papers which came the key innovation of the displacement current. Now, in 1845, Mike Faraday had shown that the plane of polarization of light is rotated when it travels along the direction of a magnetic field, as is shown in that diagram. This is what we now call Faraday rotation. Inspired by Thomson, Maxwell inferred that magnetic fields were essentially rotational in nature. Now, notice he's doing no more than using this as an analogy, but then converts it into a physical model. So, first, Maxwell considered that the magnetic fields were going to behave like rotating vortex tubes in fluid flow. The axis of the vortex tube defines the direction of the magnetic field in space, and then fill, space is filled up with these vortices. So we put in another one, another one, and another one, and there we've now got a uniform magnetic field defined by the r axis of the vortices. Now, strictly speaking, to get the exact analogy, it's the vorticity that is equivalent to the magnetic flux density, and again, Look at my, my book if you want many more details of how all of this works. So that's the analogy. But he recognizes a problem. If you've got these rotating vortices, then the friction between the rotating vortices is going to cause them to disrupt. And so he did what any good mechanic would do, and you put ball bearings or idle wheels between the vortices. And then you'll get the picture in the bottom of the diagram, where you will see the little idle wheels are rotating in the opposite direction, and so all the vortices can rotate in the same direction. So that has put these little idle wheels or ball bearings into the structure of the model for the, for the medium. So Maxwell then identified the idle wheels with electrically charged particles, which if they carried a if they're free to move, would then carry a current through the medium. But in insulators, they are not free to move. Now, here's the picture from Maxwell's original diagram from the Philosophical Magazine of 1861. And in this, the vortices are replaced by these hexagons. Think of them, hexagon tubes. And you can see the little ball of bearings running between the hexagons. And so if there is a current, then you can imagine the little ball bearings running along the interface between the, the vortices. Now, remarkably, as I show in my book, you can account for all the known laws of electromagnetism by this very simple model. And here are just some examples that if you, again, showing a magnetic field and a current carrying wire, we've got the magnetic field disturbance in the presence of a current sheet, and you've got electromagnetic induction. Change the current in one of the conductors, and then that will propagate through the system and induce a, an effect in the other conductor. Now, uh, it's very interesting that this uh, British approach to uh, model building is, is very much a British, Scottish, English tradition, much more intuitive than the French and German physicists who adopted a much more abstract and mathematical way of looking at it. Here's what uh, John Heilbronn uh, writes. And this is an example of Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald had in mind mechanical models that is, detailed representations of physical phenomena, especially light and electromagnetism, in terms of the motions and interactions of hypothetical particles or media. The representations were not meant to be taken literally. And here's what Fitzgerald said. 
to suppose that the electromagnetic ether is at all like the model I'm about to describe, which is made from tennis balls and rubber bands, would be almost as bad a mistake as to suppose a sphere at all like x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared, and to think that it must, in consequence, be made of paper and ink. In paper three of the series, Maxwell realized that he could work out the speed at which disturbances could travel through this model, which could be an insulator or free space. He realized he had to take account of the currents associated with the tiny displacements of the electrically charged particles under the action of an electric field. And to do that, he then had to add a new term to the equation for the magnetic field. So in addition to J, the normal current, he had to put in this current due to the displacement of the, of the particles from their equilibrium position. That's why it's called the displacement current. So that's what he did. Now, to his amazement, he found that the speed at which the experiments then traveled to the medium was precisely the speed of light. Its value had been recently measured with high precision by Foucault, and also Weber and Kohlrausch had measured the ratio of electrostatic to electromagnetic units with high accuracy, which Maxwell needed to work out the speed of the waves. Maxwell's estimate agreed within about 2%. And in Maxwell's words, we can scarcely avoid the inference that light consists in the transverse modulations of the same medium which is the cause of electric and magnetic phenomena. It's quite an extraordinary uh, discovery. Now, of course, this is a real a string and ceiling wax models for empty space or, 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 or medium. And Maxwell was quite candid about this. He writes, the conception of a particle having its motion connected with that of a vortex by perfectly rolling contact may appear somewhat awkward. That's putting it mildly. I do not bring it forward as a mode of connection existing in nature. It is, however, a mode of connection which is mechanically conceivable and it serves to bring out the actual mechanical connections between known electromagnetic phenomena. And this, of course, was represented the discovery of the unification of light and electromagnetism, one of the first of the great unifications. Now, that was all fine, but then in 1865, Maxwell came up with his really great paper called The Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field. Now, in 1864, while he was at King's College London, Maxwell then developed the whole theory on a much more abstract basis without any special assumptions about the nature of the medium through which electromagnetic phenomena are propagated. There were no longer no more vortices, no more idle wheels, only fields. And what Edmund Whitaker writes is, in this, the architecture of his system was displayed, stripped of the scaffolding by aid of which it had been first erected. There was only one almost apologetic reference to his papers of 1861 to 62. But, as we will show, the mechanical origins were deeply in this paper. Now, when I was writing uh, the article, uh, I had to go back and, and spend this wonderful three weeks living uh, Maxwell's inside Maxwell's brain. But it looks horrible, the paper, until you translate it into more modern notation. So the first thing I did was to take the whole paper, paper scan it all, put it into LaTeX, and then start uh, transforming into modern notation. So here are some of the things I had to do. Mass of the body had to go from C to M sub 6, 3. Forces had to go from A and B to F, A and F, B. And so the, you see down the list, all of these sorts of things to try to make it look uh, more accessible to, to my modern eyes. And what had to do with the same with all the electromagnetic magnetic phenomena. So uh, you've got things like magnetic intensity, alpha, beta, gamma have got to go to HX, HY, Z, and so forth. Displacement curves goes from FG and H2. You, you, you get the idea. Uh, transform it, and then we'll see what happens. 
Well, here's what happens. Here's one of the uh, pages from the original uh, version of the 1865 paper uh, in its form, and it looks slightly horrible. You say, oh, my goodness, whatever is going there. But then when we make the translation, it looks like this. And I looked at this, I said, this makes me happy. This looks more or less like the way that we know Maxwell's equations nowadays. Now notice uh, in what we're going to do, we're not going to be in strictly SI units. They're going to be mixed units because of this. we have not rationalized uh, the way that the SI system is done. But anyway, you can recognize the equations. You obviously got curls there and everything else that you need to get going in Maxwell's equations. Now, let's then just run through uh, the papers, and it's the first three uh, sections that really are important in the sheer genius of the paper. In the first section, he reviews the whole of uh, electromagnetism, and it's a brilliant summary. But the key thing is at the very beginning, he says, the difference between his approach to the theory compared with those of Weber and Neumann, the, the great uh, German theorists. In their approach, they were using the Metonian concept of action at a distance without any account of how forces are transmitted from the source to the other bodies. Here's what he states. He preferred to seek an explanation of the fact in another direction by supposing them to be reduced by actions which go on in the surrounding medium as well as in the excited body. In section three, he said, the theory I propose may therefore be called a theory of the electromagnetic field because it has to do with the space in the neighborhood of the electric and magnetic bodies and may be called a dynamical theory because it assumes that in the space there is matter in motion by which the observed electromagnetic phenomena are produced. This is all within the first couple of pages of a 60 page paper. Central to the theory was the elasticity of the medium through which electromagnetic phenomena are to be propagated. And that leads to the concept of the displacement current as a necessary part of the theoretical apparatus. The displacement current was no more than the elasticity of the medium. Equally importantly was to formalize the process of electromagnetic induction that can produce currents. So these were all the things he had to get on top of. To do this, Maxwell had to assume that there is an ethereal medium pervading all bodies and modifying only in degree by their presence. That parts of the medium are capable of being set in motion by electric currents and magnets, that this motion is communicated from one part of the medium to another by forces from the connections of these parts. So Maxwell had to assume there was an ether as a physical component of the universe and his logic is set out beautifully in his contribution ether to the ninth edition of the encyclopedia britannica in 1878 it's a beautiful article which i recommend you you try to track down now we move on to part two and this is on electromagnetic induction now, this is a lengthy part, and it's normally ignored because it is pure mechanics, which gets transformed into electromagnetism. The inspiration for this approach is, came from Lagrange's Mécanique Analytique. And remember that Maxwell had been familiar with the French school of analytic, uh, analytic mechanics uh, from his school days. But it does in indicate um, Maxwell's very deep understanding of mechanical systems and electromagnetism. Here's what he does. Now, this is absolutely astonishingly brilliant in my view. Now, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is taken from, from his paper. What he does is to consider a solid body, an extended body, C, in which there are two forces acting at two separate points on that body. 
and what he writes down are then the effect of forces acting at the points A and B due to their simultaneous application at different points. We won't go through this, but this is the way that Lagrange and others would have done it, and ends up with the equations at the bottom of the page for what he calls the the the, the virtual force the uh, that would have would result from the action of the two forces at the separate points. And you'll see the things in the curly brackets at the bottom are going to be used to define a momentum. What he then uh, does here is to call this the momentum referred to point A and the other referred to point B. So what you're doing here is again, now introducing this equation at the bottom again, where you can find again the summation over all the parts of the system. Now, this is the point at which Maxwell then introduces Newton's second law of motion, F equals dp by dt, where p is the momentum. But now these momenta are going to be these mechanical quantities here. You see the combination of the force at one point and then the, uh, and then the next effect of this other second force through the second one through that second term. And then these are defined as the reduced momentum, which will actually describe the combined actions of the two forces applied at the points A and B to the rigid body. Now, again, it's important to appreciate that these momenta are not real momenta any more than a reduced mass is a real mass in the description of a two-body system. They're simply ways of combining masses to make the mathematics uh, more tractable. Then he adds a, a resistance force. If there's friction in the system, then we'll call that R times V, the velocity of the system. And then we get this complete set of equations here, which are again mechanical systems to illustrate uh, the effects of electromagnetism. Now, it's characteristic of Maxwell that he then went on to design and build one. He built a mechanical system exactly illustrating that set of mechanical equations that we've just looked at. The illustration appears in the second volume of the third edition of Maxwell's treatise. Again, Maxwell died in 1879, so he never saw this, but it was there. And then the model uh, was built, again, during Maxwell's lifetime by Messrs. Elliot Brothers of London in 1876. And here is the picture which appears in the treatise on the left, and here is the model on the right. Now, it belongs to the Cambridge Laboratory, but we've got it on loan uh, to the Whipple Museum. Now, uh, fortunately, they uh, agreed that I could uh, actually use that to actually see what actually happens. Now, in this case, the rigid body is a flywheel which has got long steel rods with masses on the end. And then forces are applied to the flywheel, cause it to rotate through a differential gear mechanism. This is where uh, Willis's book is very important because Maxwell really knew about how differential gears work. So here's what he does. Uh, you're going to apply the forces to this I to the uh, the bevel wheel X through the forces A and B, where A is going to be kept stationary in the first instance. And then we got to see how what happens when it works. Well, uh, here's me with it in the Wibble Museum, and we'll see what happens on the video, which I hope you'll be able to enjoy. So here we go. Uh, here is me again in the Wibble Museum uh, with Maxwell's uh, mechanical words. And so we now rotate the disc through the system and notice the left hand one remains stationary because of the friction caused by that width. So we've got the one I'm rotating is rotating. And then when I stop, there's a very tiny effect of it going the other direction. We'll do it again, but now I'm going to go a little bit faster. Now got you. you see the other one is still remaining stationary as I speed it up. And then when I stop it, it rotates in the opposite direction to the direction of deceleration. 
But now we'll do it one more time, and now I'm going to do it really fast. So do watch what happens. We get it going up very fast, faster and faster. Nothing happens until I actually stop it, and then it goes in the opposite direction to do selling for. I think it's a terrific demonstration. And it's got all, all the features of electromagnetic induction. You will notice that there's only an effect occurring during the deceleration of the disk, and the other one speeds up as shown in this. This is exactly what happens in electromagnetic induction. So you can see what Maxwell did. He's got his mechanical model, which he now transfers into electromagnetism. The reduced momentum now becomes the vector potential, the, the frictional force becomes the resistance, and you get exact the equations for, ele for electromagnetic induction. Notice this beautiful thing that what is the what, for what were these momenta that were introduced actually becomes the vector potential A. And that you remember in when we come to look at relativity becomes the momentum uh, component of the full vector. Again, but even more staggeringly, these equations are identical to those which appear in another of Maxwell's groundbreaking papers on the stability of control systems on governors of 1868. And that paper can see exactly this paper as well to understand the stability of the control system. Engineers regard that great paper as the origin of cybernetics. Well, let's get back down to the to the business of the equations. With that, now Maxwell had 20 equations for 20 variables. And here are these 20 equations. Again, it looks formal, but actually it's very much simpler than it looks on the surface. We've got three equations for the magnetic force. That's H, given by this equation here. And you'll notice these things which look like curls. Three equations for the electric currents. Here, we've got them here. Again, we've got curl-like things happening here, being uh, giving J. Three equations for the electromotive force. Here they are. And again, this is beginning to look familiar with dA by dt, d phi by dx, giving the electrostatic. This again, giving the uh, magnetic force. Three equations of, uh, of electric elasticity. That's the displacement currents. Three equations of electric resistance. Here's Ohm's law appearing in Maxwell's 20 equations. Three equations for the total currents. That's adding together the normal current and the displacement current. One equation of free electricity, which tells us that electric field lines originate on charges. And one equation of continuity. Here that we've got the uh, continuity of, of, of current flow. So these are the 20 equations, and we've also got 20 unknowns. Here they are. The electromagnetic momentum, the, what we call the vector potential, the magnetic intensity, electromagnetic force, current due to true conduction, dismissing current, total current, and then quantity of free electricity and electric potential. And you see one's got there the complete set. And in fact, it's not, as, it's not so different from the form that we know them today. So what I've written down here then are all of these 20 equations, but now using this unrationalized uh, SI system of units and using the notation that Maxwell used. But the key thing to note is that everything on this is written in terms of fields rather than forces. The forces have disappeared, leaving only fields. Now, I, I'll highlight here, these are the ones which normally appear as Maxwell's four equations in their standard form. It's, it's absolutely beautiful there. But there are the addition bits and pieces which make it more complicated than it actually, actually is. Now, here are the important features. Now, whereas the electric displacement had appeared awkwardly in the papers of 1861-62, it's now deeply embedded in the structure of electromagnetism. And in the second section of this part, he says it corresponds to the opposite electrification of the sides of a molecule or particle of a body, which may or may not be accompanied with transmission through the body. 
In other words, the idle wheels, they're totally unnecessary. The phenomenon of electrical displacement is simply unnecessary, must occur due to the action upon molecules or atoms of the system. As we said before, the electromagnetic momentum A is now what we call the vector potential. And the origin of the identification is very clear from the above discussion, but it also presages the way in which, the, in the vector notation of special relativity, the four, vector, momentum for vector vector is got the energy term phi over C, and then the spatial components are the three components of the four vector. And in Maxwell's work, he makes very liberal use of the vector potential in the development of the equations, in contrast to contemporary practice. I actually think we should teach electromagnetism using the vector potential from the beginning, and then you would get rid of the necessity of having to mess around with not using tensors. Now, intriguingly, Maxwell includes Ohm's law in his exposition of the structure of the equations. And we don't do that in the contemporary way of doing it. Maxwell was well aware of the empirical basis of Ohm's law, in contrast to the equations of electromagnetic induction. And one of the first successful projects uh, which he carried out when he became a Cavendish professor was to establish Ohm's law with much improved precision. And with George Crystal, he showed that the law was absolutely correct to very high precision. It's a brilliant piece of experimental work and one of the first successful pieces of experimental work carried out in the new Cavendish laboratory in the 18, 1870s. Notice also that we've got what's normally called the Lorentz force. We've got this term E equals mu V cross H, uh, d minus dA by dt, and you'll see we've got the E equals V cross B appearing at this uh, point, early point, long before Lorentz wrote it down in the 1890s. The final section uh, of this part of the paper is to determine the energies associated with the fields, and here they are written down here. It is beautiful. It's exactly what we would write at the present day in modern notation. Now, the key and the, the real brilliance of this paper is his insistence that this was a different way of looking at, at physics. He writes, in speaking of the energy of the field, however, I want to be understood literally. All energy is the same as mechanical energy, whether it exists in the form of motion or that of electricity or any other form. The energy in electromagnetic phenomena is mechanical energy. The only question is, where does it reside? On the old theories, it resides in the electrified bodies, conducting circuits and magnets in the form of an unknown quantity called potential energy or the power of producing certain effects at a distance. In other words, it's action at a distance. On our theory, it resides in the electromagnetic field in the space surrounding the electrified and magnetic bodies, as well as in those bodies themselves. And it's in two different forms, which may be described without hypothesis as magnetic polarization and electric polarization, or according to a very probable hypothesis as the motion and the stream of one and the same medium. And that's the great change. That's the revolution in this paper. It's replacing action at distance by fields acting throughout space. Well, I won't uh, uh, go through the other four parts of the paper. Do go and look at my uh, paper if you really want to see what they say. It's an absolutely wonderful paper, uh, I've got to say, and uh, it's just one of the great papers of physics. So uh, that ended up then with Maxwell's equations in their final form. Uh, Maxwell, as usual, was remarkably modest about his achievement, uh, but uh, this is what Francis Everett calls a rare moment of unveiled exuberance in a letter to his cousin Charles Kay. I have also a paper afloat containing an electromagnetic theory of light, which, till I am convinced to the contrary, I hold to be great guns. That's Maxwell being excited. 
Maxwell's last brief paper was published posthumously in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 1880 and concerned a means of measuring the speed of the air through the hypothetical ether. And this was the inspiration for the michelson morley experiment. Now, here's what he writes. Even if we are sure of the theory of aberration, we can only get differences of positions of stars. And in the terrestrial methods of determining the velocity of light, the light comes back along the same path again. So the velocity of the Earth with respect to the ether would alter the time of the double passage by a quantity depending on the square of the ratio of the Earth's velocity to that of light. And this is quite too small to be observed. Now, what Maxwell hadn't appreciated, but Michelson did, was that in fact, extremely tiny differences can be measured by interferometry. Here's what Michelson stated in his books, Light Waves and Their Uses. Maxwell considered it possible, theoretically at least, to deal with the square of the ratio of two velocities, that is the square of one over 10,000 or one over 100 million. He further indicated that if we made two measurements of the velocity of light, one in the direction in which the Earth is traveling and one in the direction at right angles to this, then the time taken light to pass over the same length of path is greater in the first case than in the second. Now, Maxwell had described the principles of optical interferometry in his Encyclopedia Britannica article, but didn't seem to appreciate just the potential potential for measuring such tiny path differences. The null result of the Michelson Morley experiment, as we all know, was then to lead to the special theory of relativity, but it, which was already embedded in Maxwell's equations, although that was not appreciated in 1880. In fact, it was Hertz experiments in 1886 to 1888 that actually demonstrated that electromagnetic phenomena pro propagate exactly as light does. But by then, Maxwell had been dead for nine years, dying tragically of stomach cancer in 18, uh, 1879. In, the, in Hertz's great experiment, he used this apparatus, which I've actually uh, had the pleasure of using in Bonn, where they've got the original apparatus there, and demonstrated reflection and refraction, polarization and diffraction of electromagnetic waves. Now, uh, here's what Einstein uh, writes uh, about Maxwell. Uh, we may say that before Maxwell, physical reality, insofar as it was to represent the process of nature, was thought of as consisting in material particles whose variations consist only in movements governed by partial differential equations. Since Maxwell's time, physical reality has been thought of as represented by continuous fields governed by partial differential equations and not capable of any mechanical interpretation. This change in the conception of reality is the most profound and the most fruitful that physics has experienced since the time of Newton. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Longair. I think that was a very interesting talk. And uh, I am seeing a number of questions coming up on the screens. And I encourage anybody else who has questions to um, write them onto the question section and send them to me, and I will read them out. Um, so let me start with the first one. And the first one is one of my own. Uh, we know that um, at the time of Newton, very few people really understood what Newton was on about. What was the position when Maxwell was uh, around? Did his contemporaries appreciate it in his arguments immediately? Was it accepted as being, um, was it adopted very quickly or were there times challenges um, to what he came, what he proposed? Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful question. Um, the, and the answer really is that the difficulty of understanding Maxwell's work was that around about 1850, 
you're changing from the sorts of mathematics which could be understood by the person in the street, reasonably cult cultivated in the street. Maxwell's equations can be a f equals ma. You're not going to be able to write that for electromagnetism. You've got to understand part of differential equations. Likewise, in understanding the kinetic theory of gases, you've got to understand where the Maxwell distribution comes from. You've really got to understand your uh, higher mathematics rather well. So I always think there's a disconnect which occurs round about 1850 between what was generally accessible through mechanical models from, from essentially the Newtonian picture to the picture of fields which are not tangible and which are much more difficult to get your head around. And you know, from teaching, you will know <laughs> that students have problems with fields. Right? Now, among the uh, um, Maxwell's work among the professionals was accepted at you know, essentially instantly. He was he was regarded as being just off scale in terms of his brilliance. And you know, and there's no question in my mind that he's right up there at the level of Newton and Einstein in terms of pure genius originality of thought. Because the change from going from Newton to Fields is, is enormous. And when we're teaching students, I don't think we emphasize enough just what a huge jump that is. You've got to think in completely different ways. So I, I think it, it, it's, it's a lovely question. Um, Maxwell, again, did was very keen in disseminating, but he he was a very he was a very shy person. He wasn't the sort of flamboyant character uh, that, that would go out and do that. Is that some help? Oh, interesting. Yes. Um, I'll now start reading out some of the questions which uh, are coming up in my screen. The first one is from Amanda. Egerton. And the question is, given that Maxwell believed that the ether existed, why is his theories one of the very few to survive without modification uh, by Einstein's special theory of relativity? Was this luck or does something else account for it? Well, in, in a sense, the answer is backwards. In the sense that um, Maxwell's equations are intrinsically relativistic and they contain within them the Lorentz transfer, transformations. And one of the problems that Maxwell had was that people said, your equations have got to be wrong because they're not relativistic. They don't obey uh, Galilean relativity. And if you, again, see my book, I, 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 I do this in, in quite a lot of detail. If you actually take the Galilean transforms and shove them through Maxwell's equations, you get a horrors, true horrors. And that's what people didn't like. Uh, but the equations are absolutely, absolutely right. And again, it's interesting that in the great, in great Einstein paper of, 18, uh, of 1905, that he starts off with electromagnetism and then shows how, they, uh, how then it comes, comes out otherwise. You know, the way that we do it is, is uh, my own favorite way is to, is to hit students with four vectors right away. And then it becomes so trivially simple to understand where the Lorentz transformations come from, where the, where the Maxwell's equations are, 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 are fair and so forth. It's, 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 it's great fun. <laughs> An interesting approach. I, I, I have to say, I feel a little bit sorry for some of your students that you go straight to four vectors. Well, it, 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 I, I'm not joking, uh, mm -hmm. because if you try to do it by the other ways, you fudge the intrinsic uh, importance of invariance. You know, the, 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 one of my, one of my colleagues in Edinburgh uh, had this one. Einstein understood two things very deeply. One was invariance, and the other was fluctuations. And if you look at his works, he uses these tools to actually do innovative physics in a way that is absolutely pure, pure, pure virtuoso. And once you've got th three vectors, it's trivial to go to four vectors. So, you know, that's, a, that's my own view. It's great fun, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, associated with uh, four vectors and vector potentials, I, I have a question from Robert McKay. Um, I challenge teaching with vector potential since it is not measurable. Do you have any comments on that? Oh, um, it, 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 the, 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 it depends whether you are a, a quantum theorist or whether you're a, a classical theorist, because in your quantum mechanics, you know that 
the, the, the vector potential is a jolly, uh, jolly physical thing, uh, but it, you don't need that attribute of it to use it in in, in, class, in classical physics. Uh, I think the, the point that, uh, that I, I'm making, and uh, the serious point I, I'm making, is that the the full vector potential um, contains both the electrostatic potential and the vector potential in it and that makes it again fall into the relativistic regime entirely naturally so that you can then do all the transformations that you like 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 like, like that with and i i think it's part of the, the the fact that this distinction between b and h you know which students really have proper pro problems with in in electromagnetism i remember the great uh, vitaly lazovich ginsburg when i was uh, working with him in moscow um, you know nobel prize by his absolute genius absolutely fantastic guy he said i will die with understanding understanding the difference between b and H. He said, and this is Nobel Prize winner, <laughs> right? Now, of course, if you're dealing with serious material media, it's very obvious what, what, what's going on. But again, that's the sort of thing where I, I, I'd like to be able to avoid having to get into too many of these difficulties. Well, I have to say that uh, to an extent you're touching on a question raised by An Song Chung, um, and which is, um, what is the reason for introducing Ian? E over D and B over H, given that um, it seems to be a linear relationship between the two. Well, um, in, in the simplest cases, yes. You know, once you start putting in into really serious uh, uh, cases like plasmas and so forth, you're going to get all sorts of uh, you know, imaginary things and so forth, and then the differences become become enormous. So you're saying that nonlinear effects, for example. Uh, occur in effectively the non-linear non relationship between um, D and A, E and D and uh, B and H. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, the, the, that, 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 that can indeed can, can, can indeed did happen. Uh, the, 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 there's no, no problem about no, no problem about that. It is it, just that the constitutive relations, which is what we're talking about, can become horrendously complicated uh, if you. Uh, for when you get to anything except the simplest systems, we we, we tend to start with the simplest ones, where again it's, it's it's a linear relationship between the two. But that's that that, that that's just making life simple for ourselves. Right. Okay. I, let me go back to another question by Douglas Blundell. Uh, it's more it's it's a slight it's a a bit of a read. Let me read it out. I well remember the excitement of the moment in my first degree course, physics course when the lecturer finally pulled together four separate laws into one unifying set of equations, Maxwell's equations. The question is, would you like to comment on the current situation in physics where we do not yet have quite have a unified force of everything? Um, effectively, the unification of uh, electromagnetism, I suppose the strong force and the weak force. Well, the, uh, every theorist and his dog in particle physics is actually working on trying to do this, and it, it, it's proving to be uh, uh, jolly difficult. And um, and you're particularly pulling in gravitation into the into the whole, into the rest of it is the is is the big big bugbear. Um, to be perfectly honest, I I I love it. You know, this this is this is the sort of thing where we, there is new physics to be found. And the question is just where are we going to find it? Um, I, I, I never worry about the fact that you know bits of what we do are, are incomplete. It just gives us all these new challenges that uh, that are there. You know, just, just let me give, give you one example. What is the dark matter? Now again, once again, every astrophysicist and his dog is actually chasing the the the, the, the solution to try to try to try to get that one. Um, is that going to produce new particles which are not present yet in the standard model, and which are going to give us clues about uh, about both the dark matter and the bits of physics we don't understand? I would be optimistic. I'm surprised that we haven't discovered the dark matter already in some of these fabulous laboratory experiments. It's going to be something pretty subtle. And so uh, that I would see this as being the challenge. Or every time we get these lack of unifications and things like that, or even the, the basis of the 
can, can uh, the, uh, the the present lambda CDM model, which has got full of problems, right? These are challenges for us to actually do new experiments to elucidate what's happened. Notice that I love experiment, right? And what I want, I, I want to get the guidance for the new experiments, the really challenging experiments that we can do to actually address this sort of question. Okay. <clears throat> To that extent, one of the questions I have, and this is my own question, is that we read that um, the development of the electroweak, uh, the development of the model for the electromagnetic force coupled with the weak force has been unified. Does that involve, uh, is that involve uh, Maxwell's equations or is that, can you do, does the, um, the unified theory bring out Maxwell's equation as a consequence or, does Maxwell's equations get effectively pushed to one side in that type of uh, unifi unification of the electromagnetic and the weak force? Well, again, the, that unification is all hanging on the Higgs boson, uh, and, and again, that, that, this is this again the you know the uh, way different. Uh, there are these these are the particles which mediate the forces. So you know, what's happening is that the photon is, uh, which is really the uh, the, the particle which is doing the equivalent of the Higgs boson in that case is just one of the mediators of the of the forces. So it's it's in there as the photon. Okay. Hmm. Let me go back to a question by An Song Chung, and her second question was, um, what was the reason for Maxwell's need for the existence of an ether? So you said that Maxwell said there had to be an ether. So why did there have to be an ether? Um, the the answer to that is a, it's a, it's a very, very, very good question. That there's no question that Maxwell model, model was, he still had in the back of his mind this model of what was going on in the medium which through which the waves move. There was no concept not the modern concept of the vacuum was not there. The idea that you actually got this this, this thronging vacuum through which photons are going to be, and you know, you it's this is one of the deep bits that we never really get to at school level, certainly, and then even in university level. Where do you actually get the link up between the two? And it's deeply buried into quantum electrodynamics. It is highly non-trivial to dig out these things. But so Maxwell was looking at this entire from point of view of the wave theory. Uh, which was all there was. You know, quantum, quantum, quantum were nowhere near. They were another 30, 50 years ahead. So you, you mean had there, to find, way, there had to be a medium for it, you mean? There had to be a medium through through, through which the waves propagated. And again, this came as, as a complete surprise when, again, in fact, you don't need it. You don't need the medium. But in, 18, in, in 1865, you needed the medium. Because that's where that's how waves work. And in, is, 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 is it Anson Chung? Is he there on the line? Or? No, and anyway, just I'm not please. sure if it's possible to um, okay, that's the organizer that's to me. bring him up. Um, I think he's an old friend, and, uh, and in, in which case uh, he ought to go and read Maxwell's paper in the in the ninth edition of Encyclopedia Britannica from 1878. It's a beautiful paper and it explains why you have to have an ether and different sorts of ethers that you need in physics to explain what we're doing. So uh, again, it's best to go back to Maxwell's own words and that, that's the, the best answer to, your, to the question. Right, thank you. Uh, and I have a, a comment question from Fraser Hatfield. Um, any pieces of advice for students of physics, given your detailed analysis of Maxwell's work, to be able to develop the skill of analogy? How important is the skill of analogy in developing scientific theories? Oh, that, 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 that's a, a, a lovely question. Um, the, the most important thing I tell students is that you've got to find your own way of understanding physics. Right? There's no way that you should copy the way I study, I, I think about physics, or the way you think about physics, or your teachers think about physics, because we've all got different experiences, we've got different brain processes. And I've got a very visual 
sort of brain. And so I like models. So I can see how things can work together. I've got colleagues who've got no visual imagination, who can only write down the equations and solve it and say, ah, that's what you meant. All right. So it's, it's, it's another way of doing it. And there's all sorts of ranges in between empirical people who do it. And you, and you just simply get this feel, this intuition for what is necessary. I regard that, that demonstration I gave tonight of the model of electromagnetic induction, showing that that wonderful model did exactly what electromagnetic induction did. That's pure brilliance on Maxwell's part. Now, and, and it's, it's why he got that from a wide range of reading over the whole range of, uh, of the things he was interested in, and then could pull together the experience from one area into, into another. And that really is, is, is the thing. If you like analogy, it can be very, very good, but you can also fall flat on your face, all right? So it's very much a question of horses for courses, right? You know, if the analogy works well, then use it and see how far you can get. But you will, you will almost certainly get disappointed by it not working just as often as it does. But again, it's a way of looking at the equations. You know, this analogy between the equations of, uh, of fluid mechanics and electromagnetic and magnetic fields in particular, that's absolutely fabulous. And again, I, I've written in my book, I wrote up a whole new chapter about how that works. And you know, simple things suddenly become much more transparent when you look at it from these two sides. Thank you. Um, my next comment is from Fraser Hatfield again. Um, is the idea of ether coming back in some theories? or some uh, models of the, the universe. Would that be a fair comment? Well, it's a sort of question I tend not to ask myself. That, you know, what, 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 what we're really interested in are understanding the forces. And that we've got a prescription which doesn't really need the ether in, in, in that way. People do try to introduce it as a way of helping it neo ethers and things like that. Uh, from my perspective, I, I prefer just to look at the more the theoretical constructs that you can make in order to be able to get a physical interpretation of the bits that we don't understand. Things like the dark energy, the dark matter, and these sorts of things. Uh, they, I, I would like a physical model for that, which would essentially not need things like constructs like ethers. That's my personal opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Robert Hewitt. Can Maxwell's equations be derived with, from variational principles? And did Maxwell know about this? Um, yes, they can. Uh, you've just got to, got, got to set up the right of Lagrangian and, and you're away. Uh, and, 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 and that again is, is, not a, is not rocket science nowadays. It's, you know, you, you'll find that in, in, in most, most, most good books. And in fact, what, what, there's, a, there's a wonderful bit of this whole story, which is that uh, Maxwell and Thompson, uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, they were both brought up in the Scottish tradition of mathematics, which was basically continental mathematics. Whereas Cambridge was very far behind, and you won't believe this, but even as late as the 1850s, Newton's laws were being taught by fluxions in Cambridge, right? <laughs> and, you know, whilst on the continent, um, the great German and French mathematicians, all the great names of analysis are French or German. There's not one English name in it, except for Green. George Green was the only original uh, English person, not my careful usage, the only, only, only careful person that really understood what was going and the need to get these more advanced techniques. So and in a sense, Maxwell was coming in at exactly the right time with the right mathematical skills to be able to do the mathematization. So it's very important that you've got the right mathematics to, 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 to do it at the same time. And the same thing happens in quantum mechanics. You know, it turns out that the Courant Hilbert methods of mathematical physics was published in the year before Heisenberg 
about Schrodinger wrote down his equations. And so Schrodinger discovered his equation, and then went to Courant and Hilbert and just took all the results and got everything. Yeah, so it, it, it's another, that's another lecture I can give you some time, which, 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 which is great fun, exactly. Again, these coincidences of the mathematics being ready, ready cooked and able to be used. All right, thank you. I have a comment from um, the earlier question, questioner, uh, An Song Chong. Yes, he is your old friend. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Hello, Anson. <laughs> Right, so let me go on to the next question by Douglas Blunda, Blundell, or Blundell. I didn't quite follow the relationship between Lagrangian mechanics and Maxwell. Could you possibly expand on that, please? Um, yes, that is um, that's a very good question. I cannot give you a complete answer because um, I haven't really looked at Maxwell's work from that particular perspective. But there's no question that he was reading Lagrange and all of these people at Edinburgh University. And they were the sorts of things he, would, he wouldn't have any, any trouble with. Now, exactly where it appears in his works, I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head. Um, the, uh, but it's something it would be a, a, a good little project to do uh, exactly how much of that he that he used. But what is important is that that idea of the driving force, that that's an amazing piece of analysis because you wouldn't find that elsewhere. That appears in, again, Lagrange's uh, analytic mechanics and clearly Maxwell was entirely on top of that. So you cannot actually get into that sort of understanding without having plowed through the oil of Lagrange equations and things like that. So I'm pretty sure that he was absolutely on top of all of that. Interesting points. Yes. Um, yes, next question is from Nick Fletcher. Do you have a view on SI units and Maxwell's equations? In terms oh, of this is something which I would prefer to avoid, I think is probably probably part of the pro, pro, probably the question. There's there are there are always these ongoing going sagas uh, uh, about it. Um, the, the the story I I, I, I love to tell is um, the SI unit has been adopted by all countries except three, one of which was Burma and another one was the United States of America. So you're, 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 talking, you're, you're talking about, the other was Liberia, you're, you're talking about a set of not very advanced countries who have not adopted the SI units. Um, obviously, the decision taken a long time ago could have been better about what you do. But once you get, well, once you get going in SI units, at least it gives you a, a unified way of doing it. And of course, there are these changes that are coming about, you know, in the SI system, just with the new absolute determination of the, uh, of the fundamental constants. Um, now, it's a, the key thing is to know what you're doing. That's the really important thing. What, what is it which actually appears in these equations? And I think very often we don't actually get that clearly enough through exactly what the meaning of these equations are. Once you've got that right, then it doesn't matter whether you ESUs, EMUs, SIs, or any old units. You should be able to, to you should be able to get it get it right. I didn't have time in my two weeks to actually re-rationalize Maxwell's paper. I think it would have been a shame probably to have done that uh, and just to leave it hanging so that there are four pies and things like that hanging around which which tell you I haven't quite got it all rationalized and so on. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Carolyn Devereaux. Um, do you think that our view of our dynamic curved space-time is today's equivalent of the ether? Um, I don't think we need the ether to have bent space-time. Right? You, you know, the space, space-time is just the intrinsic geometry of the uh, of the universe, and again, it uh, that is bent by gravitational fields. That, that's just, that's just the way it is. So, you know, I. I, I, I think we can we can do without uh, reintroducing the ether for all of this. It's um, it, it, it is. 
I think that general relativity actually is something which we could begin to approach getting to young young people in a more human way than having to plow through all the tensor calculus and that. The ideas are actually quite simple, but but very profound, and uh, and and we don't really need the ether, ether, ether to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the last question. Um, so, if you have got any other questions, now is the time to put them in because we'll be coming to the end of this fairly soon. Uh, but this last question is from Amanda Egerton. Uh, I, I think she asked one earlier. Do you believe that Maxwell devoted too much of his time to the theory of colors? Could he have developed the theory of special relativity, do you think? That's a very interesting question. It's one of these other hypothetical what if questions which, which, which has occurred. Um, first of all, the Maxwell's work on, on light is, is absolutely terrific, and it really is the basis of the modern CIE uh, system, or system, system of system of colors. Uh, I've got another lecture about that as well, which uh, again, again, again is is great is, is great fun. Um, I think you've got to regard it as part of just that's the way that Maxwell was. <clears throat> he he, he cl clearly loved these challenges and these equations uh, for, for, for light combination are really very, very good. Um, now that leads then to the question of uh, could he have discovered special relativity? Now <clears throat> the, the answer to that, that, that's interesting in terms of its timing and, and what actually happened. Uh, in 18... In 18, um, let me get, get, get the, the, the timing, the timing of this right. When the Michelson-Marley experiment uh, was 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 done, um, and and the again the, uh, the 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 invariance of the speed of light was was demonstrated, people went back to Voigt's paper and discovered that Voigt had actually derived the Lorentz transformations by requiring Maxwell's equations to be invariant between frames of reference. So that the Void, in, I think it's 1886, uh, that the, the Void's paper uh, was published. And that essentially, that was something which I believe could have been done by Maxwell, but there was no motiv motivation for doing it at that mm. time. So you, did, you didn't have something like the, uh, like the Michelson Mori, Mori experiment. You know, it's, it's interesting that in, in Einstein's great paper, uh, on special relativity, he doesn't <coughs> mention the Michelson Morley experiment at all. It, 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 it's staggering. And I think the reason I think is that everybody just knew it. It was just part of the furniture by then. No, <laughs> nobody would ever question an experiment by Michelson. It was far too good an experiment. If, if Michelson did it, it was right. But mm. it remained, a, again, a problem. Now, um, again, I, I don't want to advertise my book too much, but you will find in the section on relativity, I actually analyze and compare the, the route that Lorentz took to deriving the Lorentz transformations and Einstein's route. And you will find that Lorentz is a totally tortured, uh, bound up with his model of the electron and everything else. And he got there after around about five or six different attempts of adding bits and pieces onto the equations. Whereas in 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 Einstein's paper, it falls out absolutely pure as the driven snow. You, you don't even have to ask it. it. It's there in the equation. And that was remarkably quickly accepted by everyone uh, as, as, be, as, as, be, as being the right way ahead. Now, well, have I answered the question? I thought you have forgotten what the question was. Um, I think I think you have actually about whether um, um, he could have um, whether Maxwell could have actually derived the theory of special yes. relativity. Because um, special, well, I, I think I agree with you because special relativity, um, Einstein effectively had this philosophical. It was a new philosophical <laughs> argument led to relativity, whereas. Um, there was a completely different set of arguments that um, Maxwell was developed, that you've described Maxwell's developments. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I would put it differently. I, I think there's nothing philosophical about it. You know, I, I, it's not that I'm against philosophy of, of physics. Quite the contrary. I'm quite happy about this. But the, but the key point there is that one had to explain the Michelson-Marley experiment. 
Now, the thing about the Magnuson Morley experiment, which people should remember, well, it, was a, it was a totally gigantic effect. You know, if, if you actually do the sums, the difference between the null result and what was expected is around about 50 to 60 sigma. Yeah. You know, <laughs> It's an absolutely colossal effect. And nobody doubted that Michelson had got it right. Now, that's what I would call a serious problem uh, yep. to, to, to solve. Uh, and, and it just toppled down so naturally out of uh, uh, Einstein. Now, the other thing to make, make a point about is that all of Maxwell's great works, which appeared in 1905, they did not come out of the blue. They all involved Six, five, six, seven, eight years of very hard work by Einstein uh, to actually come to. It's just a coincidence that the three great papers all appeared in 1905, but each of them had involved a great deal of very hard slog for a number of years. And uh, I love that bit of the story too. <laughs> yes. Well, we're coming to the end. I think we've only got about five minutes left. There's one person here which I would like to read out, and it's from Alessandra Rossetti. Uh, and she's, um, and let me read it out. I don't have a question, but I would like to thank Professor Longear because he reminds me of why I've chosen to study physics many years ago and leave a thought about a poster which an engineer colleague of mine had in his office showing Maxwell's equations with the title, If I Remember Correctly, it locks the act and it created light. And I think you this evening have done an excellent job in creating light. And with this, I think I should hand over to Nikki Thomas for the vote of thanks. Nikki. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, we're not hearing you, Nikki. Well, since <laughs> Nikki is unable to uh, get through to us at the moment, so perhaps I would like to just uh, finally, finally thank you once again, Malcolm, for a really excellent talk on behalf of the uh, Institute of Physics, um, Hereford and Worcester branch. I think we've really enjoyed your enthusiasm and taking the, the human aspects of um, Maxwell's life and also the mathematics and the physics. It's been very interesting to see how this all fits together and uh, to see the evolution from fairly basic um, equations to what became the, um, the equations which, which predicted the speed of light. Um, and I remember the excitement, same as Alessandro Rossetti, the excitement when we suddenly saw Alec Maxwell's equations coming up with the speed of light. So I, just, I remember my own excitement at that time in the lectures. So thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure giving the lecture. Thank you. And I, and I think with that, the organizers will now um, be sw switching the uh, broadcast off. Well, th thank you.